Good morning. And welcome to worship here at University Lutheran Church in Clemson, South Carolina, for those at home. My name is John Highland. Amen. I would invite the congregation to please stand and turn towards the baptismal font as we continue with confession and forgiveness.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, for, for in your wisdom, wisdom you have formed us. us. You feed the hungry and clothe the naked. We bless you and praise your name forever. You set free those who are bound. We bless you and praise your name forever. You raise up those whose courage falters. We bless you and praise your name forever. You provide for our every need. Accept our grateful praise. You have called us from all peoples. We rejoice and bless your name forever. You bless your people with peace. We bless you and praise your loving grace. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. For in your wisdom you have formed us. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, throughout time you free the oppressed, heal the sick, and make whole all that you have made. Look with compassion on the world wounded by sin, and by your power restore us to wholeness of life. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. The first reading is from the fifth chapter of Deuteronomy. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy, as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter or your male or female slave or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock, or the resident alien in your towns, so that your male and female slave may rest as well as you. Remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The word of the Lord. We will sing Psalm 8 as directed in the bulletin and led by the praise band.
second reading is from the fourth chapter of 2 Corinthians. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is the true God who said, let light shine out of darkness, and who has shown in our hearts to give the light of knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the second and third chapters. Glory to you, o Lord. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, God, look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? He entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for humankind and not humankind for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come forward. And he said to them, Is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him how to destroy him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated, and any children would like to come forward at this time? Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Margot, this is Sophie. Sophie, this is Margot. And who, Margot, who is your, who's your friend here? Uh, Mambo. Mambo. Well, welcome to all three of you. I'm curious, how many, do you like when it rains? Yeah. Yes? What do you like about it when it rains? What do you like about it when it rains? I'm curious, for me, if you see a puddle on the ground, do you walk around it or do you stomp through it? You stomp in it? <laughs> so do I. That's one of the things I like about when it rains is there's puddles. See Mr. Dan right there? What he likes about the rain, he says, is a good day to plant stuff. I was looking for a translation. I didn't quite. Plant things with your mother. You, you plant things with your mother? Yes, it's wonderful. And so the rain then comes, and it helps 
grow everything we planted. So that's another good thing about the rain. There's a saying in the Bible or a writing in the Bible that says that God makes it rain on everybody, the just and the unjust. And I'm not worried about you keeping track of that part. I just want you to know that God loves you and sends this beautiful rain to help grow plants for food that we need to eat, but also to make these wonderful puddles that we just have a lot of fun splashing through. Because my guess is when you're happy, smack, jumping through puddles, it brings a smile to God's face. So if you'd like, I'm going to fold our hands and you can say a prayer along with me. If you'd like, you can repeat the words. Dear God, Thank you for today, for the wonderful rain, the joy of puddles, and the growth of your creation. Thanks for loving us. Help us to love others. Amen. Thank you both for coming. Thank you for all of you for coming up. We'll stand for our hymn of the day. Good job. Oh, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works I hand that made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display, and sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down, from lofty mountain grandeur, and hear the brook, and feel the gentle breeze. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. But when I think that God his Son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim, my God, how great thou art. And sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, 
how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Well, let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, since we've been away from Mark's gospel for a little while, I'd like to provide a brief recap of everything that has occurred up till now. As you may recall, Mark's gospel begins not with Jesus' birth in a manger, but with John the Baptist's ministry in the wilderness. John calling on people to repent and prepare the way for the Lord. Jesus meets up with John, gets baptized in the Jordan River, and is immediately driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. And transcending the temptations by the devil, Jesus is strengthened for his public ministry, which he begins in Galilee. He calls the first disciples, casts out an unclean spirit, heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever, goes on a preaching tour, cleanses a leper, heals a paralytic, has some introductory theological skirmishes with the scribes, the Pharisees, all within the first two chapters. Which brings us up to today's reading, with Jesus' first head-on dispute with some of the Pharisees. It's important for us to recall that even though no one knows with certainty exactly who the Pharisees were as a collective, we do know that they were observant Jews like Jesus and the first disciples. A note I gleaned from the Jewish annotated New Testament says the Pharisees had three major characteristics. First, they represented primarily artisans and small farmers. Second, they were only moderately Hellenized, that is, influenced by the Greco-Roman culture around them. For the most part, their religious ideas were not influenced by Greek thought. And third, they accepted what they termed the tradition of the fathers, non-biblical laws and customs said to have been passed down through the generations. Well, additionally, Josephus, a Jewish historian of the day, described the Pharisees as extremely scrupulous in observing the law, and they were expert in its interpretation. And that agrees with how Apostle Paul described himself, saying, as to the law, a Pharisee. That is, I took God's instructions to heart. I did my best to live them out fully. In our day, Pharisees... uh, might be akin to a devoted church elder or sincere Sunday school teacher, people seeking to love the Lord their God with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength. It's also important for us to recall when we hear these conflicts between Jesus and the scribes and Jesus and the Pharisees, that these were inter-family disputes. There was and is a long, long tradition of debate within the Jewish community of how best to observe God's law, how to live as God's people. And what a family member with their bonds and history can say to one another is quite different than when those outside the family begin to chime in and how their criticism is received. Interpretation of God's law, of God's instructions on how to live most faithfully as God's people. That's what was going on between the Pharisees and Jesus. It's what continues to go on in our day between various Christians all claiming to follow Jesus while expressing wildly divergent views and application of God's command to love God and to love our neighbors. So here is Jesus and the disciples walking through a grain field on the Sabbath, and they decide to grab a snack by plucking some heads of grain. Some Pharisees treated this as more of a gotcha moment than a learning moment. So they confront Jesus and ask, why are his disciples not properly observing the Sabbath? Why are they doing work? 
This may seem a little over the top. Certainly you are prohibited from actually working in your fields on the Sabbath, but plucking a few heads of grain? The Sabbath is God's gift to humans to not work ourselves to death, to relax, give God thanks for all God's good gifts, and build our trust in God that God truly does provide. But plucking grain is hardly gathering a harvest. So I think that this may be an excellent example of what is called building a hedge around the law, something that we've discussed at length in our Wednesday Bible study. Building a hedge around the law is like the warning track in a baseball stadium before you actually get to the fence or the wall. You're not going to hit the fence or the wall if you pay attention to the warning track. So too, you won't be at risk of breaking the law if you don't go past the cautionary warning of the hedge. If you don't pluck any grain on the Sabbath, then you are assured that you'll never break the command to remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy so that you may rest. And not just you, but your whole household, your working animals, the resident aliens in your midst, everyone deserves a day of rest. Jesus uses this example to do some rabbinical wrestling while also making an astonishing claim. Jesus argues from the greater to the lesser. Surely if it was okay for King David and his companions to eat all the holy bread from the house of God when they were hungry, it must be okay for Jesus' disciples to do something far less egregious and eat some grain in a field. Jesus goes on to remind the Pharisees that the Sabbath is God's gift to humankind. It was created for them, for us, and not the other way around. Then Jesus makes the astounding assertion that the Son of Man, He, is Lord even of the Sabbath. That's a pretty audacious claim, and at the very least must have let the Pharisees scratch in their heads. Then part two of this confrontation narrative occurs within the synagogue, a house of worship, a place of learning. There in the synagogue, a gentleman with a withered hand, which would have made it difficult to work at full capacity in an agrarian society. Doable, yes, but unlikely to be as employable as those with two functioning arms. Yet this is not a matter of life or death on the Sabbath, the day to keep holy for the Lord and not do any work. It's one of the top 10 commandments and needs to be followed, so put a hedge around it and come back tomorrow or any of the five days after that. That's the logical thing to do, but not the compassionate thing. And even though this man did not come to the synagogue in search of Jesus or in search of healing, he found both. Jesus could not understand why the Pharisees' hedge was more important to them than the man's hand. Jesus got both angry at them, so take note, Jesus was no stoic. Then that anger gave way to grieving for their hardness of heart, their seeming inability to put themselves in the man's place. If Jesus was offering to heal you today, would you stop him? and hope he would be there tomorrow or the day after. But by healing this man on the Sabbath, some of the Pharisees had seen enough and wanted Jesus gone, literally or figuratively destroyed. I can't say for sure, but I can say from experience, when someone's righteous zeal consumes them, it's difficult to have a conversation. Any room for humility evaporates. Any possibility to acknowledge there may be other perspectives disappears. Tunnel vision takes over. In seminary, our pastoral care professor taught us that in times of crisis, our vision narrows. We get laser focused on what's directly ahead of us. And that can be helpful at times just to be able to take that next step but what can be also helpful is when loving family and friends around us open up our field of vision once again to help us navigate more wholly what is ahead of us. I never thought to apply that 
to these Pharisees until now. Jesus was a threat to their identity as being the, the, T-H-E, interpreters of the law. And that challenge to identity can be met with a degree of shock, then humility, then openness, like Nicodemus in John's gospel, or met with violent reaction, as in this instance, narrowing their vision to focus on one outcome, even going so far as to conspire with people who you can't stand, the Herodians, to achieve your misguided goal, the destruction of Jesus. I'm fairly certain that is not a God-pleasing activity for the Sabbath. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Do your best to rest. Rest from labor. Rest from the fear that God cannot provide enough for us to get by. Rest and enjoy the beauty of God's creation. Maybe splash through a puddle or two. Amen. Please stand as you are able. <clears throat> Together to let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended to heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. We come before the triune, triune God to pray for our committee, communities, ourselves, and our world. Guide your church to expressions of faith that bring rest and release. Teach your faithful people to be attentive to the spiritual, physical, and societal weariness of our neighbors, that we proclaim your grace through tangible acts of mercy and justice. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Keep us mindful of the rhythms of nature as the days lengthen and the seasons shift toward summer. Grant relief to areas facing flooding or drought and bring favorable weather for the flourishing of crops gardens, and orchards. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Where there is affliction in our world, bring healing. Where world leaders are perplexed, bring clarity of vision. Give a spirit of discernment to political advisors, institutional researchers, economic analysts, and all vocations that inform the work of the government. Merciful God, receive provide wholeness and respite to all who are weary, those who struggle in any way, and those who care for them, including Russell, Jackson, Harriet, Francis, John, Larry, Joyce, Gail, Pat, Rosalind, Tony, Martha, Bob, Randy, Alton, Scott, Greg, Mona, John, and Jean, Chris, Ken, Elise, Nadia, Ellen, Pat, 
Ann, Mark, and those we now name either aloud or silently in our hearts. Strengthen first responders and healthcare workers in their times of exhaustion or frustration. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Stir our hearts toward abundant generosity among neighbors who experience hunger and food insecurity. Bless feeding ministries and community food efforts, especially community gardens, farmers markets, food pantries and little free pantries. Open both our hearts and our tables. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Lord, hear now these other prayer petitions offered up by these your people, whether spoken aloud or silently in their hearts. We remember the communion of saints whose lives made visible the saving life of Jesus Christ. Guide us by their example to embody the treasure of your love for the sake of our world until we come to our final rest in you. Merciful God, receive our, prayer. receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Let us greet our neighbor with a sign of God's peace. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. 
Do this for the remembrance of me. And again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await your promised life for all this dying world. Pour out upon us the spirit of your love, O Lord, and unite the wills of all who share this heavenly food, the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. We'll join in singing the Lord's Prayer. be seated. For our community distribution, those who are seated to my left, if you'll please follow or fill the altar rail from the back around to the center, and on my right from the center around to the back. I'll come first with bread, or if your preference is a gluten-free wafer, please let me know so I can serve you. And then Dan will follow with a tray of wine, or if your preference is grape juice, you can extend your index finger uh, for grape juice. <clears throat> for those communing at home, offer the elements the body of Christ given or broken for you and the blood of Christ shed for you. But this is the Lord's table, and everyone is invited to come forward to receive.
please stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace. Amen. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you now and forever.